Total War Rome is one of my favorite games of all time and truly stands the test of time in terms of gameplay and enjoyability, especially with all the added features of the remaster. With that being said, no game can be perfect, and I figured we could learn a thing or two about history by seeing how closely Total War Rome sticks to the real world setting it seeks to depict. This video was sponsored by Creative Assembly, but it really takes, you know, no real motivation or incentive for me to cover this title. It's an age-old classic that I used to love. Uh, it's one of the things that got me into history, got me into YouTube, and so it's just a great pleasure to go back and revisit this title. Uh, and we're going to be taking off our rose-tinted glasses here to take a look at the different faction rosters, and you can see here I have a master list of everything. Uh, all the factions broken out by their units, I have them grouped by what's good, what's bad, and what's truly ugly for each of the rosters, and at the end we'll be going ahead and putting this into a faction uh, tier ranking list based off their historical authenticity and accuracy. And so skip to the end if you want to see that, if not we're going to be going ahead and diving into each one of these. So at the very start we're going to go ahead and pick it up with the Romans. So in uh, Total War Rome, they're going to be classified into four major factions. The first one is going to be Rome, SPQR, trying to represent, for instance, the Senate. And then they have three major factions, the Julii, the Brutii, and the Scipii. A couple things to note here before we even get into units, the name and convention is, is quite horrendous. It doesn't really follow the name and convention of, you know, the Latin name and convention, let alone the Roman name and convention. Um, so and, and also the things that they're alluding to aren't quite right here. So what do I mean by that? Well, the first thing is that um, it seems like what they're trying to talk about here is what's, you know, the Roman gens, which is these high level clans in Rome, where when you have someone's name that's broken up into three parts, their praenomen, nomen, and cognomen, the nomen in the middle is all about their clan name, their gens. And then after that, the, the cognomen at the end is going to be your your usually your your sub branch of that clan, and then the first part of your name, the premo nomen, is kind of your personal name. So an example that's always given is Gaius Julius Caesar. Gaius is kind of like his generic name, um, and then the Julius, the part in the middle, means that he's part of the Julia gens, the Julia clan. So Gaius Julius, and then Caesar. Caesar at the end means that he's still within the Julia clan, but Caesar. The Caesari is like a sub branch of that clan. And so essentially, what CA is trying to do here is have these major gens, these major clans represented. Um, but they kind of botch it in the sense that the Julia clan here is, in fact, a major clan, a major gens. The problem with that is that these other ones are not high level clans, these are actually sub branches. So, for instance, the Brutii here are actually falling under the Junia. So they're a sub-level of the Junia, they're a sub-branch of the Junia, and same thing goes when you go to the Scipii here, they're actually um, under the Cornelia gens. And then in addition to that, once you peel back another layer, the naming convention as well, Scipii, they would have actually been known as the Scipiones, and then the Brutii here is a little bit odd, they're trying to allude to, I think, Brutus, but yes, he was part of that, I believe the Brutii uh, you know, sub-branch, but in the campaign they put the Brutii on the south of Italy, and that's more having to do with this um, this group of people known as the Brutii, but it's it's just kind of happenstance that it's the same name. It was not the same sub-family, uh, and so conflating those two is not really historically accurate. So right off the bat, we, we have some problems with the Romans here. Um, so that just gives you a little bit of context. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, and dive actually specifically into the units. So most of the Roman roster, I would say, is on the good side. You have your standard infantry from the Republican period to, you know, late Republic and Imperial era. You have your cavalry, you have some auxiliaries, then you have your artillery corps. So okay, that's fine, that's all good. It's hard to get that wrong, though, because, you know, the Roman army is so well attested to, at least in terms of antiquity. Some stuff that starts to be on the border is, you know, Praetorian Cavalry, they're mostly known for being on foot, maybe later on, you know, they might have mounted up occasionally, um, but later I believe by the time that Roman, you know, Imperial bodyguards became actually mounted, that was more in the east and more so associated with non-Praetorian units um, that, that kind of supplanted them, so I don't think you would have really seen Praetorians on, on, on horseback like this. Uh, and then in terms of the bad peasants, wouldn't have really seen that in a Roman army, War dogs wouldn't have seen those as well, uh, and then the idea of having gladiators in an army is quite laughable. 
yes, of course, gladiators did exist, and I, I you know, a applaud the fact that they, they, they make nods to different types of gladiators, but you wouldn't have seen those in a military context. Um, maybe you could argue that there were times in Roman history when there was a crisis, like I believe the Illyrian Revolt, where Rome desperately needed armies and essentially, I think, freed some slaves or exchanged uh, freedom for the slaves if they were to serve in the military. So then you saw some slaves, maybe some of them would have been gladiators, who were drafted into the army, but they wouldn't have served as gladiators on the battlefield. It's not like you, you know, hire a, a tailor and he shows up to the battlefield with his gear. He would have had his Roman equipment. So these are these are pretty bad, but not nearly as bad as kind of the ugly stuff that we started getting into here. The flaming pigs is just, I, I, I want to say totally made up, and it really is. Um, the only instance of flaming pigs is kind of this ad hoc mention in our sources where, for instance, I think it's like at the Battle of Beneventum, the Romans, I think had things like, you know, the chariots with flames on them and scythes, maybe another siege. There was said that the an elephant was coming to batter down the gate and then someone lowered down a pig. There was like little small anecdotes of it happening on an ad hoc basis, but nothing on the level of entire units. Uh, so that one makes no sense from a historical standpoint, but from a gameplay and fun standpoint, oh yeah, I had a ton of fun with those when I played this. Uh, but the biggest egregious one I would say is the Arcani. These are depicted as being this like ninjas on the battlefield, totally made up. Uh, I tried to do some digging on where the name comes from and it's really hard to find them. I don't know why CA went with the Arcani name when they could have just as easily drawn from, you know, um, the speculatories, which we just covered. Those are actual Roman spies and potentially assassins or why they didn't use the frumentari, the more dis domestic spies slash people in charge of, you know, grain dole and logistics. The use of Arcani is weird in terms of just the name, but then also its implementation is totally wrong. So that's that's definitely on the ugly side of Rome. Uh, and then we can go ahead and start to get into kind of the Hellenic world here. So we have Macedon, which for the most part is pretty good. They have, you know, hoplites, pikemen, a little bit of weird stuff when it comes to having levy versus phalanx pikemen. Phalanx pikemen is, is, is a weird way to name that. Um, a little bit of redundancy there. Uh, and you'll find that a lot of times they have names that are anglicized or made too generic. So for instance, using light lancers instead of something like um, Sursa Foroy or something like that is it, it, kind of too generic for my taste. I wish they would have had a, a splash of, of more historical accuracy for the name. But as for the roster, I mean, it's not bad for the Macedonians here. There's Macedonian Cav, Companion Cav. Okay, great. And then of course, having access to siege engineers. That's well attested to. Some stuff that I have on kind of the bad list is, you know, missing Thessalian and Thracian cavalry and your, your specialized skirmishers like Agrianians. But okay, not too bad in their omission. Some of the worst things I would say in terms of the ugly is really going to be uh, not having slingers and especially not having shield bearers. Having hoplites and especially elite hoplites, that's that's a great omission because they, they feature prominently in the campaigns of Alexander. Uh, and then when it comes to the Greek cities, again, they hit most of this stuff pretty well. Um, Spartan hoplites, their depiction is a little odd. I can understand having it in here from a marketing perspective, but implementation, it's, it's kind of all over the board. They have them with the, you know, the Lambda shield, which is okay, that's late Spartans. Um, they have them with the, the Pylos helmet, which is again, kind of late Spartans. Um, and then they have them with this long dress. It's weird instead of the line of thorax or instead of just having a simple tunic. So the, the depiction is quite weird, but okay, I can understand having Spartans in the roster. The rest of it is pretty solid. Uh, lots of um, skirmishers. Yes, that makes sense. The heavy peltis was kind of an odd choice for me. I think what they were alluding to was the thorough foray, which is essentially you have a certain point in time. Um, on the battlefield for the Greeks, they have their, their quite rigid, you know, hoplite formations. And then they have, you know, supplemental skirmishers um but that they find that later on it's quite useful to have something that is has the flexibility of a skirmisher but doesn't crumble under the pressure and so eventually greek and helletic armies develop the use of this it's essentially a heli, heavy peltis where it's a it's a skirmisher but he can hold his own and that's essentially the the thoreo foroi uh, again they anglicized the name and then kind of generalized it so i don't really like that i would have loved if they just called it the thoreo foroi or something um, in terms of other things from the roster, I think the bad is that they miss, you know, if they're going to do the Spartans, they might as well do the Athenians, the Thebans, the Argives, give us other specialty hoplite names, and specifically, you know, where is the sacred band? 
um, where are your specialized cavalry? I would have loved to see those. Uh, and then in terms of the ugly, you know, just including the pigs in there again doesn't make much sense. Um, when we go to the Seleucids, I do like their roster. It's pretty good. They have stuff like, um, they have Hoplites, great. They have Pikemen. Again, I'm not a super fan of the names. Phalanx Pikemen and Levy Pikemen, it just, just call them Pikemen. And then maybe have like a veteran Pikemen unit. And then of those, a specialized veteran pikeman, which is the Silver Shields, the Agriespides, um, which are historically attested to. But it's, it was a special unit that just had, it was it was actually the, the core group of folks um, that had like a, a long track record. And so it's not like you could just recruit them and they become Silver Shields. It more has to do with the, um, the lineage of this specific unit. But I'm glad to see them on the roster. And then the Seleucids, yes, were known for, for drawing on kind of eastern roots and having cataphracts and other, or other cavalry like that, uh, some, some hangers on from the days of Alexander. And uh, yes, the Seleucids and other um, successor kingdoms did experiment with other forms of kind of X factors on the battlefield, be it scythe chariots or, or war elephants, and both kind of the smaller essentially naked variety and then the all the way up to the, you know, the how to armed and then armor uh, equipped variants. I think that makes sense. Um, in terms of stuff that I thought was bad, again, probably missing the Thereophoroi, or at least Heavy Peltist, that should have been in this roster. No mention of Slingers, they should be there. And then Silver Shield Legionaries, I thought was a bit of a weird inclusion. I think I know where CA is getting this from. I think it's from the idea that we covered in another video on Imitation Legions, which is to say, when the Romans rose to dominance, uh, a lot of people were trying to copy their mode of fighting. And so we have our sources that mention um, certain kings hiring centurions to train their troops. Um, and then you get a generic passage that says, you know, they equipped them in the manner of the legions. We really don't know what that looks like. Did it mean that they literally bought the exact same? Did they have pilas? Did they have, you know, the exact same scudum and all that? Um, it, it's unclear. We don't know. Um, so I thought this depiction was taking it a little too literally. On top of the fact that I think in our historical record, it doesn't ever really say that the Seleucids were really into this. I think it was mostly, um, I think the record when it shows up is more having to do with Pontus. So I thought that was a little weird to have here. But but by and large, the Seleucids are doing okay. Uh, in contrast, you get to the Egyptians. And oh my god, this this takes a turn. You, you look at Egypt and you wonder, my, my boy, what did they do to my boy? And it's 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 awful. The Egyptian roster here is something plucked out of the Bronze Age. So you can you can zoom in on this, and it's, you know, okay. I'll give them this. You could give this to any army: slingers, skirmishers, and bowmen. And this will be historically accurate. But quite quickly, things start to go into the the negative direction. Like, okay, Nubian cavalry, yes, maybe Nile cavalry. That's a little generic. Yes, chariots. But but quite soon, it, it kind of flows into this bronze age type thing the chariots here the depiction of the the infantry by this point in time i mean we're talking about the um the ptolemaic dynasty which is a a, a successor kingdom that when they found they took over egypt you know in the time of alexander and then after that they ruled it for several centuries um by the time you have cleopatra she's closer in time to the the moon landing than she is to the um to the construction of the pyramids and on top of that, the population of Ptolemaic Egypt had brought in a lot of uh, imported people and colonists from the Greek world. They had settled veterans, and when it came to fielding armies, they drew heavily on those troops. So you would have seen a lot more Greek units in the roster, in addition to pulling in foreign mercenaries like Galatians. So I think those are all missing. So that's really the big detraction here. Hoplites, no Sarissas, no Thereophoroi. In addition, another egregious factor is no use of elephants, despite Egypt being famous for fielding hundreds of elephants at the Battle of Raffia. So I thought that was odd. And then another weird take is these, these kind of made up Pharaoh's Guard units. So, so by and large, Egypt is kind of uh, just face plants in terms of historical accuracy. Uh, moving on, we'll go into North Africa. Um, so Carthage is, is fairly well covered. You have a lot of these units from various places like Iberia, the Libyans, Phoenicians, Sacred Band, pretty well attested to. Same thing goes with Skirmisher Corps. I'm glad to see that they have the Balearics. Um, Elephants is pretty good. And then you have your, your cavalry here. Not too bad. The, the, again, the naming convention kind of throws me for a loop. So Spanish mercenaries. Why Iberian in one case? Why Spanish? Spanish was never really a term at the time. Should have been Iberians. And more specifically should have been like, you know, like uh, Lusitani or, or, or uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name. But anyways, 
Um, th there's a bunch of specific tribal names that they should probably be using here. And then specific to cavalry, I don't know why they're calling them round versus long shield. Presumably it's supposed to be like, you know, buckler type for skirmisher and long shield for more like combat focus, close quarter combat. But the naming convention is odd. Why not call them, you know, your more citizen cavalry or, or you know, your noble cavalry, which would have been the elites of Carthage, which took the field as, as horses at times. Um, but by and large, I think they're missing a lot of mercenaries. So this for me goes into the bad. No, no big roster of Greeks, no Gauls, no Italians. Those all would have made a uh, an appearance. Uh, chariots are also missing. Carthage had that uh, that tradition of being obviously Phoenician, and so they drew the uh, the Bronze Age traditions of having chariots in the Near East. That would have come to Carthage, and we know that early on, I believe it was Malchus and his invasion of Sicily, uh, brought with him chariots. So they they were quite quickly phased out, but still, you you should th see uh you should you should see chariots here. Um, and then some stuff that to me starts to go into the ugly is uh, armored elephants. No real clue that the Carthaginians had that. Yes, they had elephants, but by and large, it, it's believed that they were using mostly the, the 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 smaller variant of the North African ones, which couldn't handle all of that extra weight. So unlikely that they would have sported more than just a, a couple armored elephants. So that's that's borderline. And then same thing here, having sacred band. On cavalry, I think Sacred Band is, is a specific unit that we hear about, but it was always on foot. Having them mounted doesn't make quite a lot of sense. It would have been more in the form of like a, a noble cavalry type unit. And then next here you have the Numidians. Uh, so their roster is quite thin. So you have your gimmies in the form of uh, your, your skirmishing corps, some auxiliary units or, or mounted troops, I should say, Numidian cavalry, war elephants. War elephants are attested to. You have references to, to King Juba, I believe, during the, uh, I think it was a civil war, so we fielded something like 80 elephants. So yeah, the Numidian, Numidians could bring their own to the field. Onagers, maybe less so. Uh, I don't think they were so well known for their, their siege warfare, so that's more of a major. Maybe. Infantry, I would have liked to see more, so that's on my bad list. Same thing with uh, long shield cavalry, I would have liked to see something more specific, maybe even using some Gaetulian uh, infantry or cavalry. Uh, a little bit more specific and a little bit more depth here. The Numidians are, are quite sparse. And what's quite odd also for them to include some desert infantry with this tall, um, you know, wicker shield that was more, uh, you know, associated with the, the Achaemenid Empire, and to put that on a camel rider seems quite odd and would definitely encumber the rider so I, I would strip that away this seems very fantastical and then the idea of numidian legionaries i think hails back to that idea of some people trying to copy the legionaries but again i think this is stretched thin in the sense that you don't really see the numidians do it until they're basically proximal with rome and even get conquered by rome and then okay yes numidians are drawn into the legions but then you could say every faction should have legionaries because eventually they're conquered by the romans um so, so i would rule that out next we have uh eastern factions so it's going to be the parthians um the parthians are done okay although it starts to get pretty bad once you get past the the, the standard fair stuff and by that i mean you have slingers and archers which is fair enough easy to do you have your mounted cavalry uh we, sorry i should say mounted archers so both horse archers and what they call Persian Cav, and then Cataphracts. Okay, pretty good. Then you get into War Elephants. So here, yes, I think the Achaemenids, for instance, had a couple elephants here and there. I think the Persians did maybe use them, but it was not very much a, a common unit that they would have used. The successor is yes, the Persians, not really so much. Um, it was mostly the, the Sassanids who would come later, who were more well known for this and had their own actually special um, uh, elephant divisions. So, so I think this is better tuned for the, the future Sassanids. Some other units in here that I think are a bit flimsy. Use of siege equipment, again, is something more attributed to the Sassanids typically. Camel cataphracts didn't really see too much of them. And then, of course, the, the stereotype of just these weak... Um, almost like pajama looking Eastern infantry, not very accurate. Yes, of course, some units would have been, you know, almost like your peasantry or your levies drawn up from whatever poor region maybe were ill-equipped. But by and large, the, the core of the Persian army was still pretty good infantry. Um, and so I think it's a bit of a trope to have these guys. Uh, and then beyond that, once we get into the ugly, so I think the use of Bedouin forces and Arab cavalry really isn't seen that much. Maybe later again in the in the future eras of the the fourth and fifth centuries, or, or later when the torch get passes, uh, torch torch gets passed on to the Sassanids. Maybe you see a bit more of those, but you know before you see Bedouins and Arabs, I would have liked to have seen you know again more proximal units like the Bactrian, Sogdian, Scythians, and especially Greek. 
mercenary infantry and cavalry that is something that is heavily missed here so by and large i would say parthia, parthia is uh, is quite a miss um, a lot of the key units are missing um, and, and just case in point if we look at pontus for instance uh nearby eastern kingdom here does have its own uh you know hoplites and sarissa units that's great Good to see, you know, more local units in the form of Pontic Heavy Cav, Cappadocian Cavalry, Thracian Mercian, uh, Mercenaries, that's all great. And yes, indeed, as, you know, kind of intermixing with the, um, the, the trend of the Diadochi, basically trying to have these X-Factor units. I believe Pontus did use some chariots, although they weren't used that much, and so that's why I put it maybe on the on the, on the the Archer variant. I think they had some scythe chariots or some, you know, disruptor chariots, but not so much of the, the mounted uh, Archer platforms. Uh, and then again, use of siege equipment, yeah, so-so. Uh, use of pirates was definitely real when it comes to, like, um, actual pirates at sea used by Pontus to disrupt the Romans and their enemies during the Mithridatic Wars uh, and, and during other wars, but, but fielding them on land, not so much. Uh, when it comes to the bad, same comment on these eastern troops, and then hoplites are, are sorely missed, uh, and especially when it comes to Greek mercenary hoplites, I think this is the ugly, they really need to be in this roster. Uh, same thing goes with more horse archers, you don't really see that represented, despite the fact that Pontus definitely had a lot of that tradition and especially having you know a, a shared border with the the steppe they they would have definitely had to have had some horse archers either themselves or the ability to draw in allied tribes uh, and then finally we have armenia armenia should basically have a roster that's similar to pontus although perhaps a little bit more eastern focus and you kind of do see that with a more focus on you know heavy cataphracts cataphract archers so i think that's all good um the infantry corps here is missing somewhat. They've gone away with the idea of, you know, hoplites and sarissa for more heavy spearmen, which, okay, I can buy. Heavy spearmen is kind of pretty generic across the Mediterranean, so I'll, I'll buy it. Um, but then when they start to to pitch again these cheap infantry, I'm not really buying it. Same thing goes with Armenian legionaries. Um, maybe some incarnation of them, but again, mostly attributed, I think, to the, uh, the Pontic kingdom. And then the use of Bedouin forces here is, is, is I feel, quite inappropriate, seeing as how far away they are from uh, the Arabian Peninsula. So that's, that's a, a poor mark on their behalf. Um, then we get into the various barbarian kingdoms. I don't want to go into all of them super depth. Um, it will stay high level. I think for the most part, they're done decently in the sense that for most of these rosters, you could just go ahead and give them spears, swords, javelins, bows, all the like and you see that repeated across these various factions so i think that's good um and, and we'll just dive into gaul for instance to comment on you know some of the history behind this so warband i think this makes sense this is essentially your troops who have sort of the cheapest equipment a shield and a spear that stuff is really cheap easy to procure swords become a little bit more expensive uh it's more of a status symbol hard to produce hard to buy some people would have had it um but I think what they're alluding to with the Chosen is essentially among the barbarian tribes, usually the way it's structured is in your armies, it's it's based around these kind of core retinues of the, of the nobility, the nobility being the rich and powerful of whatever tribe. They have the money, they have the influence, and they have this reciprocal relationship with their, their warriors where they have essentially, they use their money and influence to equip their warriors with better gear. Um, and in return, the warriors then get either payment or uh, fame, notoriety, other things from the the, 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 the the leader. And so that's that's kind of what Chosen Swordsman is supposed to be. It's like the retinue of the local warlord uh, or, or noble. So I think that's a, a pretty good distinction. And this is a good basis for most um, uh, kind of barbarian factions. They have the same thing happening here with barbarian cav and noble cav. It's kind of the same thing as, you know, generic versus your, your noble mounted forces. So I think that's pretty well done. Uh, Germania is a little bit lacking when it comes to they just kind of stripped away the other infantry and just gave them axes. I think that's going the wrong direction. Um, and then you have a little bit of spice. So in uh, in Britannia, um, they have some chariots. They have some woad warriors. Yeah, chariots for sure. Realistic woad warriors as its own unit. Not so much, but I'll, I'll give it to them. And then Spain here showing a little bit more. Um, cavalry uh, and they do actually give them some scutari and i think the reason for that is because the the roman scutum is is believed to have come from iberia itself so that's a bit of a nod to that and the idea that actually a lot of um kind of I iberian heavy troops did actually fight similar to the romans big heavy round shield 
uh, precursor javelins, then drawing the sword afterwards, very similar to the Romans, so I, I like that inclusion. Um, one of my main gripes when you look at these different barbarians is essentially that they give them all of these like naked fanatics, which, okay, maybe does occur from time to time, but it was not really the norm. I think, again, for the most part, you would have seen people uh, trying to armor up. And then you see some weird stuff here and there. For instance, the, the Germans get Gothic Cav, which I think is more... Um, only really comes into play later on in the again the period of great migrations as you get into the fourth and fifth centuries uh, so it's odd to see this one tacked on here same thing with night raiders mostly made up uh, and then when it comes to the the ugly of the barbarian roster i would say it's it's mostly going to be the the continued use of these warhound units which really don't make much sense historically um, and then of course the, the use of these druids um, yes druids are real but their use on the battlefield is not especially in this way where they're they seem to be depicted using their kind of like cultivation uh, sickle in battle that's just ridiculous um, and then some other kind of flavor units that creative assembly added uh, you know head hurlers doesn't make much sense you know we we do know that people in the past did collect trophies in battle but i don't know of any historical attestation to those trophies then being thrown at the enemy so that's that's quite bizarre and then for the germans again some weird stuff the first one to note is the berserkers okay yes maybe uh, you know generally germanic culture does have these like warrior cults that are sometimes tied to certain deities odin or or bears or other animals so maybe yes berserkers kind of but but never really in the in the germania that we that, that we know of during the roman period they're mostly only really ever cropping up when it comes to the vikings and even then it's it's a fierce uh historical debate whether or not they actually existed as a as a unit at all or if it was just kind of lore um, so yeah, Berserkers are on the ugly. And then the two additional Germanic units that are that are pretty bad is the, the Chosen Archer Warband. Just consider the, the, the idea behind this. We talked about how the Chosen Warriors are supposed to be the one that is essentially your, your noble has given people good weapons and armor in order to, to win fame and glory on the battlefield. It doesn't make much sense to, to equip your guys and then stick them in the back of the formation as archers. If you're going to go to the trouble to pay them, and give them good equipment they're going to be up front with you in the front winning glory having chosen archers doesn't make much sense at least in this context uh, and then this one is I, I find absolutely hilarious screeching women as a unit i don't know if you could get away with that today um, but i do know where they're coming from i think the main idea is that with some of these germanic tribes and kind of migratory tribes um, there's the idea that when they would go into battle um, they would actually bring their families with them. The families would be in the back of the battlefield in carts, women, children, non-combatants, and they would essentially be yelling at their warriors to encourage them, basically saying, you know, if you if you let this battle line fall apart, the enemy is going to come to us and they're going to enslave us, they're going to slaughter us, so you better not do it. So that's what they're nodding to. But I think the implementation of just calling a unit screeching women is, 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 uh, is, uh, is quite bad in the context of historicity. Uh, so yeah, that's it mostly for the Barbarians. Um, for the Iberians, you get some flavor units like Bull Warriors, which I don't think are very historically accurate, but it might be based on maybe some archaeological findings of, of certain helmets that are in the shape of the bull. So, okay, fine, I'll, I'll give that to CA. It's, it's bad, but it's not ugly. Um, the, the one thing for, for Spain, I think, is the very name Spain. It would have been more apt to call them Iberia. Uh, but I, I can kind of let that slide. Uh, then we have two more of these kind of Barbarian Kingdoms, Thrace and Dacia. Um, both of them located somewhat near each other and so the roster is kind of like a mix of sort of generic barbarian plus you should see some more um, kind of greek influences and that's you know indeed what you see here uh thrace has hoplites sarissa and then of course the famous fox and bastarne so those are good to see there and then your mix of skirmishing units so that's that's all good um for the dacians they go a little bit harder in terms of you know um more cavalry units um, a little bit skirmishers, so they tried to distinguish them, but in reality they, they probably would, would have both have some mix of, of, of hoplites. Um, an interesting thing to note here while we're on kind of the good category is the use of ballistas and onagers. I really like this for Dacia. I don't know why CA did it, but I know why kind of I would do it. Uh, and I think two reasons. One is if you look at Dacia kind of on a map, 
Um, the, the Eastern Front that they usually controlled, there's a string of kind of Greek cities along the Black Sea. So having control of that as a, as a Dacian king would have given you probably access to engineers and, and manufactorum. So, okay, cool, you can produce artillery. And then I think there's a story also during the Roman Wars with the Dacians that uh, during one of the pieces, Rome agrees to actually give some specialized siege engineers to the Dacians. Uh, and so presumably they were able to, to give them access to ballistas. So I think that's, that's what that's a nod to. Um, but again, some stuff where they, they go a little um, on the on the wild side again. Chosen Archer Warband, Warhounds, and these Fanatics is, is kind of my main gripe with these factions. Um, and then finally we get to the Scythians. So the Scythians here are uh, quite a narrow roster. Um, and they have here some Archer Warbands. I'll buy it, people on foot with the bow. But most of their roster is going to be on horseback. You see uh, you know, your standard Barbarian Cav, Noble Cav, Scythian Nobles horse archers and a noble horse archers. So mix of units mounted all having, you know, spears and then archers with varying degrees of armor. Okay, I all I, I buy all of it. Where you start to lose me is when you start to have like these Scythian noble women. Yes, we know that the noble women or, or women in general did fight in some battles, but I don't think they were ever in their own specialized unit. So I have this on kind of like by the border. Having an infantry unit that's just axemen to me doesn't make much sense. You would have thought that they would have been using spears or swords. I think the axe is more associated with, you know, cultures that probably have axes just lying around, which is basically woodworking. And I think when you're on the step, probably not too much woods to work with there. So I don't think axemen, if you're going to have any infantry, I don't think axemen makes sense as your base unit. Uh, if you're going to have anything as your, your guys on foot, probably would have been more like spears. Um, so, so I find that to be a little odd. And then the stuff that's the ugly is going to be, again, you know, Chosen Archer Warband, Warhounds, Onagers out in the steppe doesn't make much sense. And then they have a flavor unit here, the Headhunting Maidens. Again, this is more fantastical. I think it's trying to draw to the idea that, yes, these Scythians did take prizes. Specifically, when it came to heads, there are some stories of them having, like, you know, making, um, you know, drinking cups out of the skulls of their enemies. That's what this unit is a nod to. But as for a unit specifically tasked with, you know, headhunting, uh, no, <laughs> doesn't really make much sense. So that's, uh, that's basically it for the recap of the roster. So I think what we can do now is go ahead and do the, the grading of the roster. Um, so let's start with the Romans. So I think the, the Romans will just bucket them all together. In terms of their ranking, I think they do a, a pretty decent job of covering your cookie cutter Romans, which is easy enough to do. They're so well, um, you know, written about. But quickly they start to go off the deep end by having gladiators in the field. And what drives it down for me is the use of incendiary pigs and especially the, the ninjas on the battlefield. To me, that drags the Romans down to at least a D, if not E tier. Uh, let's go ahead and put them... Uh, you know, I would put them up here at first, and then this is for the good, the bad drops them down to a B, and the ugly at least drops them another two buckets. Let's give them a, a D for now. Um, Macedon is pretty good. The roster is filled out quite well here, but they're really missing out on key units like I think shield bearers. Um, so that is 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 quite noted in their omission. That's a, a quite big no-no. The Greek city-states, I would say, are a little bit better. The main omission is going to be these specific you know, Sacred Band, Sarissa's, um, specific type of hoplites, but they, they kind of have it covered in hoplites, so I would say they're they're okay. Greeks are probably like mid-tier here, not too bad, um, but the uh, the use of the pigs drags it down a little bit, so I'll put them on kind of the lower end of this C-tier. Seleucids, you'll see, is one of the few that has essentially nothing in the ugly, and of the things that I would nitpick, it's like the Legionnaires and Thurifoyer and Slingers, it's really not that big of a deal, so if anything, I would actually be tempted to put these Seleucids up at the top. And then on the opposite end comes, comes in Egypt, swinging us wildly to the uh, to the other side of things. Like I said, basically representing the Bronze Age, so they're a, a category of their own down in the F tier. Uh, Carthage is pretty good, nothing really in the... Um, in the ugly category, although they are missing a lot of their mercenaries, which to me is quite um, substantial when it comes to representing Carthage accurately. So I would probably tend to put them kind of in this D tier, bordering on E tier, but they, they do a lot of catching up when it comes to like the main roster. So I'll, I'll put them in the D tier. Uh, e tier for Numidia is the fact that um, it, it's quite sparse and they're really missing out on a lot of stuff. So, and having desert infantry with, and, and legionnaires in particular, I think sours them a little bit in my eyes. So we'll put them on E tier. Parthia as well, I think we'll join them. Mostly for the use of Bedouins. 
um, not having your specific Bactrians, etc., not having Greek mercenaries, that, that drops Parthia down pretty far, I would even say bordering on F tier, they're missing a lot of core stuff. Um, Pontus does a little bit better, yes, they're missing your Greek mercenaries, but they have some specific kind of local phalanx units, they have a, a good mix of cavalry, they have Thracians in the mix, they have pirates, so it's, it's a good nod to some some of the historical variety. If anything, I might even put them at a, like a B tier. I think they're not bad. Uh, and we might even bump that up to A tier. Pontus is, or, or Armenia, I guess, next. Um, their use of Bedouins kind of drops them down. I would otherwise probably have them on par with um, Pontus, but right now they've dropped back down to C tier for the use of the Bedouin forces. That, that really doesn't make much sense. And they might even be, be straddling C and D. Um, beyond that, we have the, the main tribes. Um, and so let's just copy all of these. I think Gaul does a good enough job. Um, they're dragged down a little bit by the Druids, so I would put that as like maybe a, let's give them a C. The Germans are, are quite bad actually um, with the um, Berserkers, Chosen Archers, Screeching Maidens. We'll, we'll put them kind of like Parthia around here. Britannia is a little bit better. Again, they use Druids and Head Hurlers, so not quite as egregious as Germania because their main roster is re reasonable. So I'll, I'll bump them up to a bit of a like an Amidia status. Uh, and then finally we have um, Spain, more aptly known as Iberia. They're okay. They have more stuff that's in the good category. Some stuff that's trash. It's mostly going to be the, the name Spain. So I'm kind of griping there. So it's not too bad, honestly. We can go ahead and kind of put them at like a maybe a mid-tier. It's not awful. Um, they, they might even be straddling these two. Let's yeah, let's give them a C or D. Um, and then what do we have left? So Thrace is pretty good. It looks like they don't have anything in the bad. So let's um, and they're only missing Thracian cavalry, but that could be in their militia cav. So so Thrace is actually not too awful. Um, let's go ahead and bump them up into. They're not quite there. I would probably give them borderline. Uh, let's just drop them in A tier because no one's there. So so it's not not too bad. And then the Scythians, it's kind of an inclusion of a weird mix of units. The Axemen kind of rubs me the wrong way. Same thing with uh, Onagers uh, and others. So we're probably going to drop the Scythians. They're, they're down in kind of like, um, yeah, these factions where they've gone a little too far in terms of the flavor units. So, so by and large, if we go back and look at this, the average trend for the historicity of these units is everything below. You know, if you take an average grade, uh, I would say uh, Rome here is failing. But only really from the perspective of a historical pedant. Um, really, this is a game after all, and so you have to balance historical accuracy and, you know, gameplay and fun and enjoyment. And I think the, the game truly does that. You know, to take a look at things, we've looked a lot at the liberties that uh, Total War Rome has taken when it comes to depicting the world of antiquity. And a lot of the feedback I've had is to, you know, just tweak some names here and there. So instead of like, you know, a, a spear armed Cavalrymen call him uh, Sarissa Foroy. Little tiny things like that that arguably might make me happy, but for someone getting into the game for the first time, they'll have no idea what the heck is going on. And so you, you have to understand the trade-off there. Um, there's also stuff about, you know, my recommendation would be, hey, give everyone slingers, archers, javelin men, give everyone hoplites, blur those lines, kind of mix and match all the factions. Of course, that's not great if you're trying to come at this from a game design perspective and you want every faction to have its own special sauce. So there's two competing motives there. And it's clear that Total War Rome errs more on the side of the fun than the accurate. And I think that's a good balance to strike that will hopefully get new and returning players hooked on the setting itself like I was years ago and encourage them to learn more. And for the historical pedants like myself, we can look forward to mods, which will inevitably spring up to satisfy all of our needs. And the game certainly has my ringing endorsement and I can't recommend it enough. Total War Rome Remastered is available on Steam, and you can dive right in today by clicking the link in the description below. Enjoy!